Today I'm out here in northern Idaho with the all-new 2020 Hyundai Palisade. This is the replacement for the Santa Fe XL in the Hyundai lineup, and it's bigger and better than any Santa Fe has ever been before. The big thing to know about the Palisade is that this has some of the best interior legroom figures in the large crossover segment. So if you're looking for a three-row crossover with room for three rows of adults, this is one of the few options in America. The 2020 Hyundai Palisade and the 2020 Kia Telluride were developed in conjunction with one another, so the two vehicles are right about the same size. Both, again, significantly larger than the Santa Fe XL that this particular model replaces, but they get a very different look overall. The Telluride is supposed to appeal to people that are a little bit more outdoorsy, it's a little bit more rugged looking up front. The Hyundai Palisade is definitely the more luxurious option. We have a front end design that's definitely in keeping with the rest of the Hyundai lineup, this large distinctive grille right up here. High up on the front end, we find the turn signals and part of the daytime running lamp module. The daytime running lamp module then continues on down to this module right here, which houses the headlamps for the vehicle. Halogen headlamps are standard, LEDs are optional. Hyundai has decided to put a huge focus on active safety systems in their latest vehicles, and the Palisade is no different here. We have standard radar adaptive cruise control with autonomous braking and pedestrian detection, rear parking sensors, lane keeping assistance, trailer sway control, and auto high beams standard on every model of the Palisade. That's definitely different than most of the entries in this segment, which may have some of those active safety technologies, but not all of them. Depending on the trim level you get, there are some additional safety systems you'll find, like blind spot monitoring the 360 degree camera and front parking sensors. The Palisade is the replacement for the artist formerly known as the Santa Fe and the Santa Fe XL. Things were a little bit complicated naming-wise in the Hyundai crossover lineup. Previously, they had the Santa Fe, which was a three-row vehicle, and then the Santa Fe Sport, which was a two-row vehicle. Then they decided to have the Santa Fe, which was a two-row vehicle, and the Santa Fe XL, which was the three-row alternative. That is no more. Now the Santa Fe is just two-row, and the Palisade is the three-row replacement. This is significantly bigger than the outgoing Santa Fe XL. That was one of the complaints that Hyundai decided to address with this generation of the three-row product. The Palisade is bigger in every dimension. It's notably longer than that particular model. It's also notably taller, notably wider as well. But the Palisade is also impressively efficient in terms of overall interior packaging, and that's really obvious when you take a look at this versus something like a Mazda CX-9. This is about two inches shorter than the Mazda CX-9, but has eight inches more combined legroom. At 196.1 inches long, this is something of a tweener, slotting in terms of overall size between the Toyota Highlander on the small end and the Chevy Traverse on the larger end of things. But we find even more legroom on the inside than something like a Traverse or a Chevy Tahoe. Moving to the back, you'll really notice the wider stance of the Palisade versus the outgoing Santa Fe and Santa Fe XL. We have some interesting tail lamps on this particular model. The full LED tail lamps are optional, they're not standard, but the tail lamp has a section right here that is your typical tail lamp, and then this gray section has some small LED elements in it as well to help combine everything together. And then we see those elements repeated down lower on the bumper, just like we saw on the front. The tail lamp modules in this top end trim are full LED, so we do have an LED turn signal right there in that module, but the backup lamp down here at the bottom is an incandescent bulb. We have some chrome accents at the bottom of the bumper helping tie it in with the front, but this is not a metal bumper like we see in some of the competition. We then have two exhaust tips right over here on the passenger side, nothing over there on the driver's side. Under the hood, there's just one engine for 2020. It's a 3.8 liter V6 engine. This is not just Hyundai's old V6 recycled. This is a newer design. It can now run on the Atkinson cycle to help improve overall fuel economy. It also gives us direct injection to help improve overall power. Power figures come in at 291 horsepower and 262 pound-feet of torque, and it's mated to a standard 8-speed automatic transmission. All-wheel drive is optional. If you choose the all-wheel drive option, then you'll get 21 miles per gallon combined. If you choose front-wheel drive, that goes up to 22. Pretty average for this segment overall. All Palisades coming to America will have the towing package standard. That gives us 5,000 pounds of towing ability, whether we're talking about the front-wheel drive model or the all-wheel drive model. At this point in time, we don't know whether that will apply to other countries that will get the Palisade, but here all models will get the upgraded cooling pre-wiring for the trailer in the back, and they'll have trailer sway control standard. Now, if you want to get the hitch receiver, that is an extra charge, but it's relatively minor and it's available on all trims. Front seat comfort comes in at 10 out of 10 points in this top end trim. We get four-way adjustable lumbar support and an extending thigh cushion. If you move down one trim level to the SEL trim, then we have a two-way adjustable lumbar support. It's worth noting that the passenger seat does not have the same range of motion as the driver's seat, even in this top end limited trim. It doesn't have the adjustable lumbar or the extending thigh cushion. 
we have a manual tilt telescopic steering column with a pretty decent range of motion. Roominess is what the Palisade is all about. We have 117.9 inches of combined legroom here. That's definitely at the top of this segment. Combining legroom front row plus second row plus third row is the most fair way of comparing overall legroom figures for three row crossovers, especially crossovers where the second row seat slides forward and backwards. That allows you to apportion space a little bit more equitably between the front row, the middle row, and the back row. As you can see with this front seat very comfortably adjusted for me at six feet tall, if the second row seat is all the way back in its tracks, I have about 10 inches of legroom left. I could very easily move this to a position where I'd have about four or five inches left, and then I'd have an absolutely enormous amount of space back there in the third row. The Palisade is available as either an eight or a seven passenger crossover. We're driving the seven passenger version, which means we get these captain's chairs in the second row. And because we're driving the top end limited trim, they're both heated and ventilated. They also have a pretty decent recline mechanism to them, and we find window shades right over there on the side doors. At the moment, the SE and SEL trims are available as either seven or eight passenger vehicles, but if you get this top end limited trim, you'll only get the captain's chairs in the second row. You can access the third row in a variety of different ways. You could walk right here through the middle if you get the captain's chair option, and there's some electric releases to tilt and slide the seat forward. There's a button right there on the bottom of the seat and one right there on the seat back, so it's a little bit easier for third row passengers to access. That tilts and slides the seat forward, in a fashion that will not allow you to keep a child seat latched into place right there. If you have a child seat in here, your only option is going to be to slide the seat all the way forward and then try and enter through this little gap right here. That means this is going to be a little bit less child seat practical than something like a Volkswagen Atlas, a Nissan Pathfinder, or a Mazda CX-9. Because those three vehicles will allow you to leave a child seat latched into place in the second row and tilt and slide the seat forward in a different manner to give you better access to the third row. The Volkswagen Atlas is the only option in this segment that will let you do that with three child seats latched into its bench seat option. Obviously, I would have liked it if Hyundai had given us a feature like that in the Palisade, but even an adult like me can still get in and out of the third row if you absolutely need to, right through that gap right there. Hopping back into the Palisades third row, you'll definitely notice this is more accommodating than a lot of third rows in this segment. If I move the second row seat all the way back in its tracks, where again, I had about 10 inches of legroom left sitting behind myself as a driver, my knees are not quite touching the seat back, although they are pretty close. There's only about half an inch of room left. Overall headroom is also pretty impressive back here. If I lean my head back all the way, my head does touch the ceiling. We find a little bit less headroom back here than we find in the Explorer, the Pilot, or the new Telluride. But headroom back here in the third row is certainly above the Ascent, the Highlander, the CX-9, the Acadia, etc., and pretty equal with the Nissan Pathfinder. In addition, this seat bottom cushion is not as close to the floor as we find in some of those other alternatives out there, so that means this is definitely going to be more comfortable for adults who find themselves in the way back. You can also power recline the third row if you choose that particular option. That's kind of a handy feature. This third row seat splits in a 60-40 fashion. This is a three-person bench back here in the third row, so there is a little tiny middle middle seat right there. I could do this if I needed to for a while, and headroom is basically the same as the outboard seating positions. In addition to the power recline mechanism, third row passengers get a few other creature comforts. We have USB charge ports, one on each side, two cup holders on each side for a total of four, and air vents back here on the ceiling as well. Out back, we find 18 cubic feet of cargo capacity, which is pretty similar to the all-new 2020 Explorer. It's a little bit below the Telluride and a little bit below the Atlas. Hyundai tells us that part of the difference between this and the Telluride is the fact that we have the optional power third row seats right there. You can see that they fold easily out of the way, and they also recline to make it a little bit more comfortable for those third row passengers. Hyundai tells us that the power mechanism for that third row seat takes up a little bit of room, but you can also see there's a little bit of a difference in the way this rear cargo hatch is shaped. This is a little bit less vertical than what we see in the Telluride. That likely accounts for some of the loss as well. Making this cargo area a little bit more practical, there is some storage space right there under that load floor, but again, not quite as square as what we find in some of the competition, likely because of that power third row seat. But you can see that we could definitely stack some of these roller bags across the back here. Hyundai tells us that there's definitely enough room behind the third row seat for you to put a larger cooler. So if you want to take eight folks to the park and then have a cooler back there for your picnic, that's definitely something you can do in here. As we take a spin around the interior, keep in mind that we are in the top end limited trim, so there are a few things in here that we won't see in the other models. This model has the optional dual pane moonroof, so there's one pane right there over the second row heads. It extends to just over the third row passenger's knees. Then there's a pretty standard sized pane right there above the driver and front passenger's heads. The driver and front passenger get two-way adjustable headrests and height adjustable shoulder belts. The shoulder belts on the second row are fixed into place. 
The top end limited trim gets upgraded leather upholstery. This is Napa leather, which is a better quality of leather. We have perforations in the seat back and seat bottom cushion because these seats are both heated and ventilated. And the second row is heated and ventilated in this trim as well. We have some contrasting piping going on right there on the side of the seat to give it a little bit more visual interest. The seats are not quite as flat as what we see in the Honda Pilot, but not quite as aggressive as sportier options in this segment. If we move on over to the door panels, we find a high percentage of soft touch material. You'll find soft touch plastics on the upper section of the door, that leather insert that matches the seat upholstery, and then right there around that armrest as well. We do have harder plastics down there around the bottle holders to help improve durability. Hyundai has made a variety of different interior color combinations available, but not all of the different combinations are available in every trim. For instance, my personal favorite is this blue and ivory interior, which is not available in the limited trim. It's only available in the SEL trim, which is the midline trim. Moving back over to the limited model that I've spent most of my time in today, we definitely have a high percentage of soft touch materials on the dashboard. Soft touch upper section, soft touch lower section right here. And then this trim insert, instead of imitating linear wood, sort of has a uh, perhaps knit fabric appearance to it. It's charcoal, you can see right there, sort of like a sparkly pinstripe suit perhaps. We have a decently sized glove compartment on the passenger side. I had no problem fitting a larger tablet computer inside there. Moving over to the center of the dashboard, we find one of two available infotainment systems. This is the larger up-level infotainment system. It's a 10 and a quarter inch diagonal screen. It features Apple CarPlay and Android Auto integration, as you can see right here. This has the latest generation of Hyundai's infotainment and navigation software, but I have to say that I'm a little bit surprised that this doesn't see the larger 12 inch screen that we do see, for instance, in the Hyundai Nexo. This system features factory navigation, and we also have a 360 degree camera view Working our way down the dashboard from there, we have the engine start, stop button, controls for that infotainment navigation system. There's some direct access buttons across the bottom for things like map, navigation, radio, media, track forward, backward, setup button, etc. Then below that, we have the controls for the three zone automatic climate control system. This is optional in this vehicle. Standard model has manual climate control. You control the rear zone by hitting this rear button and then controlling the controls via that infotainment system above. Below that, we find our electronic shifter. This is a button style electronic shifter, drive, neutral, reverse, and park right there. There's an auto brake hold, enable, disable button. And then to the right of that, we have the drive mode selector. In the center, there's a lock button that will command a full lock of the center coupling that will stay locked at lower speeds only. Once you achieve a certain speed, it will unlock automatically. We then have a button to disable the auto start stop system, 360 degree camera access button, parking sensors, and hill descent control in this model. Below that, we have controls for the heated and ventilated seats and the heated steering wheel button. We then have this large storage bin right here between the front seats. We can pull that back and close it completely off, push the button and open it. This acts as both the phone storage area, miscellaneous storage area, and cup holders. So if I press these buttons, you'll see that those cup holder dividers pop out. The Qi wireless charging mat is tucked in this area right there under part of this compartment. So you can see I can pull that phone out. You can see the whole phone right there. And then you do have the option of pulling cords through that area and using the storage compartment that's right there under the center console. You could definitely put purses, perhaps even small backpacks in that area. The center console is padded and it opens to reveal a fairly large storage compartment. There's a little shelf right there that you can remove. And then you have access to the USB and 12 volt charge ports. You could likely fit a gallon of milk in there. This top end limited trim has both a full color heads up display and a 12.3 inch full color LCD instrument cluster. This is the same size that we see in a lot of luxury vehicles out there. If you get one trim level down, then we get a smaller color screen in the middle. This screen changes based on the drive mode, but it doesn't change as dramatically as we see some of the competitive LCD screens out there. For instance, if we go to sport mode, comfort mode, eco mode, etc., you'll notice that the colors change, but we don't get entirely different shapes in this display as you'd find in, for instance, a modern Cadillac. The steering wheel is a round design with a split bottom spoke right there and paddle shifters on the back. We have up on the right and then down on the left. You'll find the controls for the adaptive cruise control system over here on the right side, in addition to the button and toggle that control that multifunction instrument cluster. On the left, we have a voice command button, mode button for the infotainment system, volume up down, track up down, and then some dedicated phone buttons. Overall acceleration appears to be pretty peppy in all versions of the Palisade. Remember, we get that standard 3.8 liter V6 engine in all trims. This is not like the Toyota Highlander, which comes with a naturally aspirated four-cylinder engine in the base model, 
you have to work your way on up the trim ladder in order to get the V6 there. Coincidentally, while I'm here at the Palisade event, we have a Telluride in our offices back in San Jose undergoing its official testing. So I'm just gonna go ahead and post the zero to 60 and 60 to zero numbers up there at the top of the screen with the disclaimer that these are preliminary numbers for the Palisade. This uses the same engine and same eight-speed automatic transmission and same size tires that we find in that Telluride model. So logically, the zero to 60 and braking scores are gonna be right about the same. In general terms, the Palisade comes in the middle of the segment. If you wanna go faster than this zero to 60, there is something like that new 2020 Ford Explorer. Its base 2.3 liter turbo will get you zero to 60 in 6.4 seconds, but there are also plenty of options that are gonna be a little bit slower than this zero to 60. In terms of overall handling, the Palisade definitely does very well. This doesn't have the rear wheel drive dynamics that we see in the new Ford Explorer. It doesn't have quite the sharpness of the Mazda CX-9, but remember, this is much bigger on the inside than that Mazda as well. And if we're talking about this top end limited trim, it's less expensive too. The Honda Pilot is an interesting alternative to this because the Pilot's overall handling ability and overall handling feel I don't think is quite as good as what we see in the Palisade under normal driving conditions. But if you're really driving that Pilot aggressively, then the torque vectoring axle in the rear will help it go around the corner better than what we see in the Palisade. The Palisade's all-wheel drive system has a predictive nature to it. And if we put it in the sport mode, for instance, it's gonna try and send more power to the rear. However, it can never send as much power to the rear as we see in the Honda Pilot, because the Pilot does use a variant of the Acura Super Handling all-wheel drive system. So this will send about 60% of the power to the front, 40% to the rear in that sport mode. If we put it in the eco mode, then it's gonna try and bias the power all the way to the front. Like other Hyundai products, if you put the vehicle in smart mode, then it's gonna try and determine what it thinks is best at the moment, switching from effectively sport mode to eco mode based on how you're driving the car. But this is never gonna give you a rear power bias like we do find in the Explorer, the Durango, and under limited conditions, the Honda Pilot. That limited conditions part is the key thing to know about the Pilot. As I've said before, the Pilot is much more fun and much faster around a corner if you're going uphill versus downhill, because downhill, that torque vectoring nature is not really going to be doing anything for you. While we're talking about all-wheel drive systems, one last thing to know is that lock mode for this all-wheel drive system. At lower speeds, this will command a complete lock of the center coupling. And that's not something that we find in all of the other vehicles in this three-row crossover segment. It's gonna make the Palisade feel more sure-footed than some of those other options on gravel, on snow, on slick, icy conditions, etc. But remember that because this is commanding a full lock of that center coupling, you shouldn't use it in dry conditions on regular pavement like we're driving on right here. Although we don't have official numbers for the Palisade yet, overall cabin quietness is pretty impressive in here. You can likely thank the laminated side window glass for that additional improvement in sound quality. Hyundai tells us that they've also put a decent amount of time and effort into the overall structure of the vehicle, putting an awful lot more sound insulation in the floorboards than we saw in the last generation model. This is unquestionably quieter than the last three row Santa Fe I drove. Hyundai tells us that the base models get essentially the same sound deadening treatments that we find in this top end trim, so they're likely going to be just about as quiet. As we've seen in other recent Hyundai products, overall ride quality is very good in the Palisade. This is certainly the kind of vehicle that you'd want to take on a long road trip. Hyundai's done a good job trying to balance the teeter-totter between good handling and a good ride. There are going to be a few options that are a little bit softer than this, but those are mainly going to be in the luxury or near luxury segment, something like a Buick Enclave. And then there are going to be options that are definitely more firmly sprung than this, like top end trims of the 2020 Explorer. It's difficult to talk about fuel economy because of course we haven't had this at home, but over 200 miles of mixed driving and a lot of elevation changes, we've been averaging 22.1 miles per gallon in this all wheel drive trim. That's pretty representative of what we saw in the Kia Telluride when we were driving it out in Colorado as well. The adaptive cruise control system is a little bit smoother than what we find in the Honda Pilot. It adapts more gently to changes in the vehicle's speed in front of you. This is a full speed range system, so it will take you to a complete stop in gentle traffic. If traffic stops abruptly in front of you, one of two things will happen. The vehicle will alert you that you need to take over or the autonomous braking system may kick in, but that's not guaranteed to take you to a complete stop. So you are still in control the whole time. The lane keeping assistance system is standard on all Palisade models, but in top end trims like this one or optional in SEL, we get Hyundai's new lane follow system. Lane following, also known as lane centering in other manufacturer speak, helps try and keep us in the center of the lane. There's a little icon right there in the instrument cluster, and it's an awful lot more aggressive at steering the vehicle and keeping it in the center of the lane. Lane keeping assistance is more like a ping pong affair. It'll ping pong back and forth on the sides of the lane. Although the Palisade is pretty quiet, they've given us an extra feature to help folks in the third row hear what the driver's saying. It's a driver talk system. We activate it right there on the instrument cluster. 
Joey, stop hitting your sister. The driver talk system works pretty well, and it's an awful lot louder than I had expected. We get kind of an interesting echo effect here in the cabin when it's activated. This is a little bit different than what we see, for instance, in the Toyota Highlander. It sounds a little bit like I'm on a department store PA system. Discounts on millinery on aisle five. In case you're wondering, this is a one-way PA system only in the Palisade, so you don't have to worry about your mother-in-law or the naughty kids talking back. Overall, out on the road, I've been really impressed with the Palisade, especially by the level of polish we find in here, from the driving dynamics to the seat comfort to just the way this feels as you're driving down the road. This definitely feels more like an appropriate competitor to something along the lines of a Buick Enclave or perhaps an Acura MDX. I almost hate to say it, but it feels like the Palisade should be a little bit more expensive than it is. So let's talk about pricing. Pricing for the 2020 Palisade is surprisingly aggressive. This will start at $31,550 plus destination. If you want all-wheel drive, that's $33,250 for the base SE trim. And the SE trim, as we'll discuss, is very, very well equipped. The SEL, which will probably account for the bulk of purchases, starts at $33,500 for the front-wheel drive model, add $1,700 for all-wheel drive. The interesting takeaway with the Palisade is that I had expected this to top out much higher than the Kia Telluride, but in reality, it doesn't. It starts less expensive than the Telluride, in fact, and the limited trim is right around the same price. Absolutely fully loaded with all-wheel drive, just as we're seeing here. This comes in at $46,400, notably less than top-end models from the competition, even though they may not have all the same features and functions or the same room that we find in the Palisade. Unlike some of the competition, the engine and the transmission are both the same from the bottom end trim to the top end trim. So even the base SE trim gets this same V6 engine and 8-speed automatic transmission. It also gets the adaptive cruise control and autonomous safety system that I mentioned earlier, the trailering package, rear parking sense, acoustic front glass. That helps make things a lot quieter on the inside because there's a double layer on the windshield and on the side windows that's designed to help reduce overall sound noise. We also get an 8-inch infotainment system and Apple CarPlay and Android. Android Auto, two features that are also missing in many of the competitive base models. The next step up from there is the SEL trim, which should account for the bulk of Palisade sales. That gives us features like blind spot monitoring, heated seats, the leather steering wheel on the inside, three-zone automatic climate control, the power driver's seat, similar to what we were seeing right here, keyless entry, keyless go, your choice of captain's chairs or a bench seat in the second row, and roof rails on the top as well. Interestingly enough, the SEL trim is about the same price as an SE all-wheel drive. So you have the choice of the added features we find in the SEL or the all-wheel drive system we find in the base model. If you want all the gadgets and doodads that you've seen today, then you want this top-end limited trim that gives us the upgraded leather, the suede headliner, the larger infotainment and navigation screen. We also get the LCD instrument cluster, etc., on the inside. And a few niceties like heated and ventilated second row captain's chairs in addition to the front row captain's chairs as well. One key thing to know about the pricing structure is if you want the eight passenger seating, that's gonna be found only in SE and SEL. Limited like we're driving right here comes only as a seven passenger vehicle. Via some of the option packages that are available with the SEL, you can get many of the same features that we find in this limited trim and keep that eighth seat, but you won't be able to get everything that we saw in this model. Now again, you will have to wait until we can get our hands on one of these for a complete week so we can run it through our usual battery of comparisons, but at the moment I can easily say if you're looking for one of the roomiest three-row crossovers in America, definitely put this on your shopping list. Also, if you're looking for one of the best deals in America, that's going to be the Hyundai Palisade as well. Now on the downside, if you're looking for one of the most family-friendly three-row crossovers, that may not necessarily be the Palisade. It depends on how old your kids are. If your kids are still in front-facing child seats, you may find something like a Volkswagen Atlas to be a little bit more child practical and a little bit more family-friendly overall, thanks to the overall design of those second-row seats. Be sure and let me know what you think about the 2020 Palisade down there in the comment section below. Also, let me know what your choice would be in this segment, especially if you're looking to spend between $36,000 and $40,000 or so. If you haven't done so already, be sure to find us over at facebook.com slash You can find us at Instagram, Twitter, all those other social things. Click on up there to the top of your screen if you want to support this channel, and I'll see you next week.